Good morning, everyone. How you guys doing? Welcome to New York City. My name is uh, Dave Wolf. I'm a managing director with KPMG. Uh, we're glad to sponsor you guys at breakfast uh, and glad to give you the only hot breakfast. So uh, congratulations on your first win uh, at the conference here. Um, I'm, I'm it with the KPMG Digital and Mobile Group. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about the voice of the customer and how the voice of the customer is not always uh, what you think you hear is what you hear. Uh, and myself and Tracy Ahi are going to be talking to you guys this morning. And I wanted to start off with that topic. I think it's very, um, it's very easy for a lot of us to, to have been used to an optical illusion, that things aren't always what they look like. But I, I want to go into and delve into what it's like where you have an auditory illusion, where the voice of the customer is not saying what you think it might be saying, and what are some ways that you can uh, approach that and solve for that uh, to make a real impact to the experience. How many people today, uh, mid-eggs, uh, are in voice of the customer or voice of the employee programs? Nearly everybody, right? So what I want to do is start off with a short video uh, to kind of open things up to talk about uh, the fact that many of the things that we hear uh, might actually be illusions. Many of us have become quick to catch illusions that trick our eyes, but how often do you consider illusions of the ear? Are you really able to trust your ears and the things they hear? For example, listen to Greg speaking. Bar, 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 bar. What do you hear? If you heard bar, 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 you'd be right. But how about now? Bar, 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 bar. Chances are you heard far, far, far this time with an F. Except you didn't. In fact, the audio didn't even change between the two videos. Bar, bar, bar. Strange as it may seem, what you hear depends on which video you're looking at. Go ahead, take turns watching each video and see how the sound morphs. Bar, bar, bar. This is a perfect example of something called the McGurk effect, which shows how our visuals can alter what we believe we're hearing. So uh, I, I encourage you guys to hop out to YouTube. The, these guys do a lot of uh, really great science. But what's really interesting is that what we hear tends to be based on, on the point of view that we have when we come in. And I find this especially true with the voice of the customer. And what I'd like to do is introduce Tracy Ahi, uh, also a managing director and a colleague I work with uh, at KPMG, to give some examples for you guys of where the voice of the customer and what they're saying may not align to exactly what's going on. So most companies have the best intentions to try and improve customer experience. Unfortunately, you know, there's always a couple of challenges in the execution. I mean, how many of you um, have gone through the following experience where you're at in a very, very long line waiting to pay for your purchases, you get to the front of the queue and the cashier is asking you, can I please have your postal code? Um, do you know that we've actually got a survey and you could win you know, $500 off at a competition? Well, the best intentions of that particular retailer is to collect information about you, the customer. But in actual fact, from our research, we know that that is one of the most frustrating experiences that a customer could go through. And then, of course, there's actually the analysis and interpretation of the information. We've had many, we hear far more about the bad experiences than, than the good experiences. Um, for example, there was a very, very large life insurer who decided um, that the interpretation of the information they had showed them that the best time to actually cross-sell to their customers some more life insurance policies was when the actual person was making a claim for their spouse's life insurance and they were actually trying to cross-sell them on the phone at that particular time. We've also had examples where people are saying, look, all I want to do is actually talk to somebody. Please don't keep on putting me on hold at the call center. All of these things actually are sabotage points and lead to very, very bad experiences. Then from an analysis and interpretation of information, we find that the common theme is that companies look at how the customer actually interacts with you, what they do, and when they actually do it across your channels. But what they don't know is why. 
What is actually the motivation behind the customer behavior? As well as what is the motivation behind the actual staff behavior that, and that particular staff that's engaging with the customer? And that's really what we'd like to talk to you about today. Because otherwise, it will always be the echo of the customer that you'll be looking at, what you think the customer may have, but really not understand the motivation behind it. And what you really want is not just to see the shadow of the customer, but you want to see the real customer and be able to interpret that behavior. So over to you, Dave. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting when you get to this analysis, a lot of the decisions in our business, based on what we hear from the voice of the customer, come from these guys. Now, I don't mean a large African mammal, right? What I mean is a hippo, it's an acronym, it's become one of my favorite acronyms of late. It means highest paid person's opinion. Um, and we hear the voice of the customer, and we hear, as, as, as um, Tracy was saying, we hear an echo of it, and the hippos step in, and the hippos make huge sweeping decisions based on what they hear. But it's interesting, we're seeing a trend of new companies that have a different decision maker coming in and making an impact. And those people are the geeks. These are people making decisions based on things being aligned to the business, being based on people and their needs and their humanity, and being refined by data and analytics. And what the geeks have figured out is that research and science makes a big impact into really understanding the needs and wants of the customers, rather than listening to an echo of what they've said later. <clears throat> the challenge is that there's a lot of ways to approach problem solving in the business and based on what you're hearing from your customers. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen this layout. This was made comically funny by Donald Rumsfeld. But he really talked about the idea that there's challenges we know of that we don't have answers to. There's challenges that we have answers to, but we don't know what the problem is. And the hardest of all are the unknown unknowns, where we don't know what the problem is or how to solve it. And the reality is, in the voice of the customer programs, that's exactly what we're facing every day. We have an echo from a customer that something's happened. And by the way, right guys, it's almost always bad. But we don't know what caused it, and we really don't know how to approach the solution. And in these echoes, what the customers tell you, even directly through surveys, is often misleading. There's a great quote by, by Henry Ford, Ford in trying to solve for the known unknown. They said, you know, when you built the car, you must have done a great job going out and asking customers what they wanted. And Henry Ford laughs and said, if I'd asked the customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse which ate less. So I gave them a faster horse which ate less. And customers never ask the question you really expect them to ask. Nobody walks into a hardware store and says, I need a quarter inch hole. But it is actually what they need. What they ask for is a drill. And it's interesting, um, one of the things that geeks believe in a lot, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this, is the idea of ethnographic research, of actually getting out of a room like this and getting out with your customers and spending time with them and observing them and monitoring them and learning from what they're doing. We did a, a, a case like this for a tire company. The tire company wanted to encourage their sales reps to go out and visit the car. So the first thing they did was they gave the sales reps a, a, a mobile device and said, when you go out to the car, you can actually scan the car. That's gonna make it really easy for you to go uh, visit the car. Except making it easy didn't make the sales reps change their behavior at all, right? If they didn't wanna walk outside and visit the car, they weren't going to. So we wanted to find a way to encourage them. And in meeting with the sales reps in this store, we asked them a bunch of questions, and one of them went this way. Um, do you like playing games? And they said, no. And the interviewer said, really, you don't like playing games? You don't get together and play games? Nope, I'm not really into playing games. I'm not a games person, okay? When you do get together with your friends, say on a Friday night, what is it you do? I have a regular running poker game. Didn't see it as a game, though. We didn't ask the right question. We didn't understand, as Tracy said, why they did that and why they behaved the way they behaved. See, for that person, he didn't look at it as a game. His why was, I enjoy being social while competitive with my friends. But that's not necessarily what they say. And these problems get only harder and harder as you get to these unknown unknowns and uncovering challenges you never knew you had. We had a client that was in the retail space and they wanted to encourage their salespeople to be better salespeople. They made an assumption of something that would make a lot of sense to those of us uh, on face value. They said, I have salespeople, salespeople are competitive, I want to build a leaderboard, I want to build something to encourage my competitive people to be more competitive. 
Except when we went out into the field and did the research and led with the geeks, we found one really surprising problem. 80% of their salespeople weren't competitive at all. 80% of their salespeople simply wanted to sell the right thing. And when we made them competitive, the calls to the call center actually went up when they sold the wrong thing. See, so the actual unknown was how do I encourage people who aren't competitive and collaborative to be better at being collaborative so they sell the better item, which they sell more often and don't call my call center with problems and concerns. And we're beginning to notice that what's happened is, and I call this slide kind of, you guys know the, the YouTube video, The History of Dance, right? The crazy guy goes through the history of dance. I look at this as the history of the way we built things uh, to solve customer needs. So what we used to do, and I, I come from a long background in the digital space, um, when we, five, 10, 15 years ago, and we called it software back then, and it had actual version numbers. Um, the way we solved the problem was we sat in a room and we figured out what we wanted to build. That was pretty much it. We put five subject matter experts in the room, we took some of the, the feedback we had from customers, and we decided what we wanted to build. And what happened over years is people said it's a lot more important than, than what we're going to build, which is who we're going to build it for. People matter and design matters. And so businesses started thinking about who they were building it for. And in swooped um, digital and mobile, and in particular mobility, and where people were and when they were doing things mattered a lot. Um, and when you begin to put those things together, you can create some pretty great experiences. I live in a city, um, and so I don't have a car. Not New York, I live in DC, the little, your little stepbrother cousin of a city, a little south of here. And um, I use Zipcar a lot. Everyone ever use Zipcar? It's a shared car service. Zipcar does a phenomenal job of understanding who they're building things for, when they're gonna use it, and where they're gonna use it. So for instance, if I log on to Zipcar on my phone and I don't have a reservation, it dro drops me right into make a reservation. If I log in five minutes later after making a reservation, it actually has an option to let me honk the horn of the vehicle. Because one of the things they found in their research, an unknown unknown, was that when you're renting a car you've never driven, it's hard to find. Right? What they actually found was, talking about the voice of the customer, they found the rental abandonment rate increasing moments before the rental was supposed to begin. And the research showed it's because people couldn't find the vehicle. And they take that where and when to, a, to another extreme when, uh, for instance, you're running late. I was running late one day and I called Zipcar and the conversation uh, was initiated by an IVR. Not generally the way you want a, a call to a business to go. But this, this experience was unbelievable. I dialed in and the IVR said, good morning, Dave. Hmm, thank you for calling Zipcar. We show you in the, Mary, in the Mazda 3 Mary Mary. It's currently 715. That car is due back at 730. Were you calling to extend that reservation? Yes. <laughs> Based on your current position, we show you need an additional 30 minutes. Is that okay? Yes. Great, thank you for calling Zipcar, and it hung up on me. Best IVR experience I'd had in a long time. Um, but, but we contend that not only is it important to know what you're building and for whom and where, but why people are doing the things that they're doing. Because once you understand why people behave in a certain way, you can actually change their behavior to perform in a different way. Think back to what I talked about that tire store, right? We were trying to motivate those people to go out and visit the vehicle. And when we talked to them, we uncovered some interesting things. Not only do they like poker games with their friends, so they actually are competitive and they're socially competitive, but getting time off to spend with their friends mattered a lot. So rather than just giving them a mobile device that they could walk out and scan the VIN number of the vehicle, we said, what if every time they scan the VIN number of the vehicle on their mobile device, they get a poker chip? Anyone in the store that works there at any moment who's scanned the most vehicles and visited the most, has the most poker chips, is the king of the parking lot. At the end of each month, the king of the parking lot gets another day of leave the following month and gets to take that day off. Now people are motivated to get out and visit the car. And in that case, by the way, from a business impact, one in three vehicles that passed through their parking lot needed windshield wipers. Windshield wipers are all margin. Right? You would love to sell windshield wipers. And you never know that unless you go and visit the vehicles themselves. So this focusing on field research and understanding why is incredibly important. 
And we've come up with a lot of ways to do this. This is um, work that was done for a company that installs satellite television. We actually went out on 47 ride-alongs along with the technicians, starting on their day. Think about how different this is from sitting in a conference room. Our folks sat in the trucks and rode along with the technicians all day long. And we learned a lot about these technicians. The first thing you learn is that people are different. They have different needs and different motivations. So the new anxiety hire and the old schooler act differently and they behave differently and they're motivated by different things. So we'll spend a lot of time learning about all of the kinds of, uh, in this case, employees that are working for the satellite company. And then understanding that there's not just a user. By the way, this is the worst word we ever used in the digital world. We call it all of our people uh, a user. It's a little like a customer. You know, there's only one other business on earth that refers to their customers as a user, right? Uh, and to connect the dots, that's the drug industry. And it's because we believed in, in, in digital world that our customers had no choice but to be our customer. The reality is they're not users, they're real people. And they're not one person or two people or three people. They're 12, 14, 16 unique types of people who have all different needs and desires. So first off, people are different. And secondly, they change. If you look at it, the, the new anxiety uh, hire someday is going to become the, the ninja. Right? Our question is, what is their journey like as that happens? And that brings up another kind of research that, that we've been doing a lot of, and it's been in high demand, which is customer journey mapping. And, and a different take on customer journey mapping. You're looking at a customer journey map for the visiting of a satellite television technician doing his job or her job during the day. It includes the things they do, the, the context. I wake up in the morning, I get in my truck, I get the list of jobs, I then go to the first job, I walk into the house, I start the work order, I do the work, I talk to the client, I get them to sign the work order, I leave, that sort of thing. The lines at the bottom, though, talk about another part of the journey, which is the emotional journey, the drive, the why. And, and some amazing things can happen in identifying what I'll call moments. For instance, the technician arrives at the home, and it's a brick home. They've never installed satellite in a brick home. Makes them a little bit nervous. They walk into the home, and the first thing they do after meeting the homeowner, and by the way, in satellite TV, the only person you will ever meet from, from your vendor is this technician. You'll never see anyone else forever, and yet you'll pay them $300 a month. At least I pay them almost $300 a month. And, and so now the technician's already nervous, comes in the brick house, sits in the house. The first thing they do is open a manual. Now the customer's anxiety is going up. Then they walk over to the tool bag, and they pull out a drill. Right? And now the customer's anxiety is really high up. These moments where the emotional journeys collide between the customer and the client help us identify a moment that is an unknown unknown. Nobody knew that the problem was that the trust of the technician is low while the anxiety of the technician is high, and the customer wants to cancel the order at that moment. What if instead they were provided with a tool that would have explained to the homeowner when they arrived what was going to go on that day? What if it walked them through the way the installation was going to go and it made them a part of the journey? And what if before that, the technician had automatically started the work order from the prior home so the homeowner knew the technician was coming? We all love that four hour window, right? I'll be there between eight and 12, which means 11.59. So already my anxiety is high before this whole thing goes on. We find this process of, of field research, ethnographic research, understanding people, and in particular journey maps incredibly powerful ways to understand what is going on in the, at, at the customer's experience prior to the voice of the customer kicking in and creating that echo. And it, you, we can find some really surprising things. Um, what the company really wanted to do was to say, we believe that we've, we, not we believe, we bought this new mobile platform and we have mobile people. And what we're gonna do is give them an application that, that looks and acts like the existing uh, application we have, and it'll do everything the technician ever needs. And they went and bought a bunch of tablets and other things. And we, and we asked them to pause, and we did that sort of research that I'd shown, building, doing the ethnographic research, doing the personas, doing the journey maps, and beginning to understand the why. And the why wasn't that they needed to roll out new technology, right? The why was that this is a complex in-home sale being delivered by a contractor that doesn't even work for the satellite television company who it doesn't necessarily understand the tech technology, and they feel very constrained and concerned to ask for help. See, if you're a contractor and you don't work for that company and something goes wrong, you're unlikely to pick up the phone and call the company because you're a contractor and you don't want to look bad. 
So what we did was said, why don't we create a guided workflow tool that helps them plan their day, that notifies uh, the customers of what's coming next, that allows them to actually ask for help discreetly, and often will suggest help based on what they're doing. See, we know their work order, we know what they're doing that day, we can likely provide them some hints and guidance through the day and prevent them from having to ask. And yes, at the end of the day, this got rolled out onto a, a mobile device, and onto the mobile device in this case that they had chosen. But we didn't start with there. We started with why is this customer experience not going well? Who is it not going well for? Where and when is that happening? And now what can I do to solve that? And then once that's done and we've rolled it out, now it's about analyzing the results of that through the voice of the customer. Not necessarily using the voice of the customer for innovation, but using it for refinement and measurement. And um, what I'd like to do is to talk about it, exactly how you can operationalize um, that sort of data coming back out of this research. Tracy's gonna go into it, but, but one of the things I want you guys to remember as you're thinking about the voice of the customer is, what are you doing ahead of hearing from the customer to understand why they behave the way that they behave and how do you align that to the business? And then as Tracy's gonna talk about, how do you operationalize this once it's in place? So at KPMG, we did a global research study um, on the cust uh, and we developed a customer experience barometer. And this was across 5,000 participants um, and in five different sectors. And what we actually found was that if you understand how, when, where, and why customers behave in a certain way, as well as your staff, these were, uh, we then actually went and looked internally at the particular organizations that rated very highly. And what we found is that these leading practice organizations all had one thing in common. They actually took the customer insights where they understood the why as well, and they actually linked it to their business performance. So instead of just having a lot of measurement and tracking of customer experience metrics, they had worked out what the relevant metrics were based on the customer behavior and the staff behavior. And in this way, they could then change the training that they were currently doing to actually match um, improving customer experience and what the customers really wanted. They could change um, each of their channels operationally in terms of ease of doing business with customers. And as a result, all of them have been far more successful in actually improving their return on investment. For example, with a global insurer, we looked at over 700 customer experience initiatives that they were doing worldwide. And what they actually found was that they were measuring a lot of customer experience, but none of them really had the couple of key metrics from a business performance perspective that was really tied to and linked to the actual customer behavior. And once they actually started measuring the right things, they could then make much quicker decisions on where they needed to change operationally and across their channels, as well as within channels, to actually be more relevant to the customers. So my question to you is, if you understand how, when, where, and why your customers behave in a certain way, as well as your staff, what is your organization going to do to then change operationally to really deliver the customer experience that your customers want? Great, thank you everybody. Thank you everyone.